So hello everyone and welcome to the 10th anniversary student astronaut reunion. Um, I'm Emily Lakdawalla with the Planetary Society and uh, we're here to uh, talk with a whole bunch of people who I can't help but think of as kids but they are definitely not kids anymore. It's been 10 years since I ran this program with this group of students who worked in the St Spirit and Opportunity missions at NASA JPL. Um, so to give you guys a little bit of background on what this program was about and who we're talking to here, um, it actually goes way back to the mid-90s, and I'm going to try to make the summary as brief as possible, but way back in the mid-90s, the Planetary Society worked with the LEGO group. Yes, the LEGO group, the, the ones who, who make cool stuff like this, uh, on a program called Red Rover, Red Rover. And this was an educational product that used Lego's DACTA system uh, in schools and were able to build in schools little tiny Lego models of Mars rovers and, and run it through software on their computer. This was amazing technology back in the mid-90s to explore simulated landscapes that kids could build. And actually, I ran this program when I was a middle school science teacher with my fifth graders. We built little Mars rovers. We, bit, we built little environments that they could explore, although we explored the moons of Jupiter. We didn't use it for Mars. So anyway... Fast forward a few years, um, there was a guy named Steve Squires, who was the pr uh, principal investigator of the Mars Exploration Rover mission, although at the time he was the principal investigator of the Mars Surveyor 2001 lander mission. He had this package of science instruments called Athena, and the Planetary Society partnered with Steve Squires on the Athena project to do an um, educational public outreach project funded by LEGO. Then Surveyor got cancelled, and its instrument package got put on the future, the Mars Exploration Rover mission. So all of a sudden, the Planetary Society found ourselves on the Mars Exploration Rover mission, which was awesome, except that we had already selected a student group to participate in the 2001 project. And so we called those guys the student scientists. Mail and Space Science Systems came in and helped out and ran a program to bring those students to the U.S., and they were able to select targets for future exploration on the Mars Global Surveyor mission. Are you confused yet? <laughs> it's a very complicated backstory to this project. A few years later, I was hired by the Planetary Society to run the next wave of the student projects, which was by then called Red Rover Goes to Mars. It was based on the Red Rover, Red Rover Lego project, but now it was going to Mars because these students were going to come to the U.S. to help operate, well, not really, but to work on uh, the rover mission that was going to Mars. And so we had one more student group in between called the Student Navigators, and finally we had this group that was called the Student Astronauts. And I ran this program to select a group of high school students from all over the world to come to Mars Exploration Rover Mission Operations and be there inside Mission Operations with the science team when the rovers landed and did their first operations on Mars. Um, I developed a contest that had them look at a Mars panorama, it was the one shot by Pathfinder, uh, to figure out where, no, actually it was a Viking pa uh, panorama, and choose where they would explore with the rover, just as though they were pretending to operate the real rover on Mars. But ultimately what it turned into was this two-month-long program where we had uh, groups, uh, student groups of two who would come in and witness everything that happened to operate the, the Mars Exploration Rovers. They saw the first images come down from Mars. They, they saw how the scientists used those images and other data from the rovers to plan each day that the rovers operated on Mars. And they wrote blog entries about it. This was actually before, uh, we didn't call them blogs at the time. It was the student astronaut journals um, because there weren't blogs at uh, 10 years ago. Or if there were, I wasn't uh, hip enough to know to call them a blog. And they wrote these journals about what they witnessed inside mission operations. I had students from all over the world. We had students from Singapore to Hungary to Poland and the UK and a couple from the US and Taiwan and India. And who am I forgetting? I think I've got everybody who's on... Oh, uh, Sri Lanka. I was very excited about the Sri Lankan one because my husband was born in Sri Lanka. And they, it, was an, it was an interesting uh, student group because it was kind of hard to have a, a group cohesion. There, was, there were 16 uh, students in pairs, and so they only overlapped two by two. So a lot of these people that you're seeing on the screen below you have never actually met in real life. Um, but they're all linked by this tremendous experience that they had 10 years ago when they were on Mars Exploration Rover Mission Operations. And so we had 16. I am extremely pleased to see that we have eight. So we've got half of them represented on this video call. Um, and uh, maybe even a couple more might find themselves uh, uh, into in the Hangout before we're 
uh, at the end of it, at the end of the hour this morning. Um, we're connecting from all over the world. I'm in Pasadena, California, where the time is 6 a.m., so I apologize for any lack of coherence that I may display this morning. The time is friendlier for most of the people on the call. So um, I'm just going to introduce you briefly, and you can just wave, and then I'm going to ask a couple questions and let you guys take it from here, because what I'm really interested in is finding out what you've been doing since you participated in this program and how it's influenced the course of your life over the last 10 years. I know for me, a lot has changed in the last 10 years. I wouldn't have identified as a science writer 10 years ago, but now I'm the uh, senior editor and blogger for the Planetary Society. Um, and I have two kids, which is a big change from 10 years ago. So I know I'm sure that a lot of changes have happened for, for these guys, too. So um, in the order that I see them, we have um, Abby, uh, Abigail Freeman, who um, uh, is in the U.S. We have Cheng Tao Chung, who can't uh, wave because he doesn't have a, a mic or, or headphones, but hopefully will uh, transmit some of his answers by, via the chat. I'll read them off for you. We have Courtney Dressing um, uh, from the U.S. We have David Tor Torsi. I actually don't even... David, I'm so uh, ashamed. I don't even know how to pronounce your last name for, for me, so I'm going to have to ask you to do that properly. We have Maciek Hermanowitz from Poland. We have... Uh, let's see. Susini De Silva who uh, is from Sri Lanka. We have Vignan uh, from India. We have Wei Lin from Singapore. And wow, what a great group we have. So I am going to throw out a question to Abby because I know that for, for all of you people, some of you, some of these uh, student astronauts have wound up staying in the sciences. Some have, some have not. And I'm interested in hearing how uh, you may or may not be using the experience that you had way back when, 10 years ago as a student in your, in your current um, life, but Abby is the one that I know who is doing right now what is closest to what you did on the Mars Exploration Rover mission. Oh, thanks, Emily. Um, so, can you guys hear me okay? Yep. Okay. Um, so, right now I'm currently a graduate student at Washington University in St. Louis, and I am studying planetary science, and specifically I'm studying Mars. Um, my advisor is actually a man named Ray Arvidson, who is the deputy PI for the Mars Exploration Rover Project. Um, so I actually am, am still involved with at least opportunity operations through my advisor. Um, I've also become recently involved with curiosity operations when that landed um, a little over a year ago. And so I'm, I'm still involved with Mars exploration as a graduate student uh, running rover operations. I'm now kind of a full member of the science team and really get to contribute to the science team discussions. Uh, Besides doing rover operations, I analyze a lot of orbital data over Mars, looking at the geology of the surface and the kinds of minerals that are present uh, in an attempt to sort of unravel the history of the planet. And yeah, I'm, I'm currently in my fifth year of grad school, so I'm hoping to graduate pretty soon and we'll see where I'm going to go from there. I'm not quite sure yet. Awesome. So um, who else wants to, who wants to jump in next? Just raise your hand. Go ahead and jump in. Who wants to, to say what you're doing now? David, go ahead. I'm going for the absolute contrast here because I'm probably the one who drifted the furthest from what we've been doing there. Uh, at some point, I've, I've slowly drifted from the science part to the engineering part because I would now uh, work as a software engineer coding auction platforms for big companies, if you can imagine that. Uh, but but certainly science hasn't left me completely. Uh, I I got there ten years ago through my high school uh, astronomy group. So after graduating high school, university, and some stuff, uh, I led that group for a few years, and then left it behind when I moved abroad to London to do the uh, software engineering work on the bigger scale. But it's inspiring to hear that somebody is still close to the fire. And um, I'm going to throw it to, to Vignan next because I, I'm looking at your background. You've got a great big Mars there. You've got to tell us not only what are you doing now, but uh, why, is, why is Mars there in the background? I just found this uh, from like 10 years ago. I think we got <laughs> that and this one over here from you. Oh, like nice. 10 years ago. So I had them framed up back then, uh, and I just put them back up here to make it more interesting. So what are you um, doing now? So yeah, what am I doing? Uh, I'm actually doing something very similar to David. Uh, <laughs> after Red Rover goes to Mars, I uh, 
participated in another cool competition called the uh, International Space Settlement Design Competition because going back to high school was just boring. Uh, and this was a team event with uh, like 14 other kids, which was interesting. So when I came back, they were all interested about space, Mars. And so I took up the opportunity to sort of form a group. Uh, it was 14 high school students from like 12 uh, different high schools, which was awesome. So we sort of did this after high school. We actually um, went to the finals, which was in Houston. And it was a lot of fun designing a space settlement. I did that, I think, uh, in my 11th grade. This was, I think, 8th or 9th grade. Um, but after that, I found myself at uh, Stanford pursuing a degree in computer science, which sort of happened organically. Once I went there, it was just everything was just computer science in Silicon Valley. And uh, yeah, so that's how it happened. And after graduation, I uh, joined Microsoft, where I worked as a program manager with their cloud computing team. That's the story. Uh, but I recently quit uh, Microsoft, and I've been pursuing a couple of startup ideas. Uh, so I'm currently a wayward 20-something. <laughs> All right, Courtney, how about you? OK, so I'm a little bit like Abby in that I'm still in graduate school. Um, I'm working in astronomy and astrophysics at Harvard. I don't work on Mars anymore, unfortunately. But I do try to find rocky planets, like the Earth and Mars orbiting other stars. And I'm really grateful that I got the opportunity in high school to learn more about how planetary geologists work so I can figure out the kinds of things that are really important for astronomers to learn about rocky worlds orbiting other stars if we really want to understand what kinds of environments might be suitable for life. Yeah, that was kind of funny. When I was in grad school for planetary science, a lot of the uh, people came in either from geology and knew nothing about astronomy, which is me, or people came in from astronomy and had no idea what a rock was. And so <laughs> the people who can combine the two things are, are a little bit rare. Cool. So let's see. Who haven't we heard from yet? Uh, Cheng Tao, by the way, why don't you uh, post in the chat a uh, uh, brief, just tell me what you're doing now, and I'll share it with the world. So Magic, what's up next? Right, can you hear me okay? Uh, barely. <laughs> barely, okay. Um, it's okay, it's okay, go ahead. Um, right, so I have um, just finished my PhD in astrophysics, actually. I Woo! Yes, uh, thank you. I have submitted uh, my corrected version of my thesis less than two weeks ago, and I'm now waiting for the final approval and graduation, um, hopefully at some point next year. So I stayed within science. I stayed within, um, broadly speaking, astronomy, although I, I have deviated further than, further than um, Corbin has, because my piece was on the result of populations of um, star-forming regions in nearby galaxies. So everything I did was on um, star formation occurring in fairly nearby galaxies. Um, and I'm, I'm really grateful to the whole project of the Planetary Society to Edward Urban that goes to Mars because that was a big part of um, my motivation to go into science to push me. Oh, hello. Um, it was a big part of what pushed me into um, into research career. And now I'm doing another um, career change, a slight change of direction, because um, come January I'm moving to Singapore and I'm going to be, I see waiting cheating there, um, and I'm going to start a bio postdoc, um, a bioscience um, postdoctoral position in automated processing of microscope images um, in, for the purpose of uh, um, identifying the biological machinery that's triggering the uh, how the Golgi apparatus works within the human cells. So, yeah, plenty of twists and turns along, along the road, but um, it all starts with River of Ghost of Mars. Cool. So, I think, Susini, you're the last one. Tell us what you're doing now. Okay. So, I still stayed in science. I graduated with a physics major in Sri Lanka, and then I moved to the United States. So, now I'm in Connecticut. I'm a PhD student in physics. But uh, my work is on deep Earth seismology. So it's not Mars anymore. It's Earth for me. <laughs> but it so, might as well be another planet. You're talking about the deep Earth. It might as well be another planet. It's not a place you can ever go or see. So Yeah, so definitely what I learn here and what I study here can be applied to 
other planets like uh, even Mars, because there's going to be another mission to Mars called InSight, I guess, which concentrates on seismology. So I'm really interested in that in the future. So right now, what we work is on um, the structure near the inner core of the Earth. Yeah, so that's what I'm working on. Excited. The inner core has structure? I thought the inner core is like the innermost layer. Yes, <laughs> inner core is the innermost layer, but I'm really interested in what's like just outside the inner core, like the boundary between the inner and the outer core. There's like lots of interesting things going on there. Awesome. Yes. Um, so I'm sorry, uh, you were the last but one, Sassini. There is uh, Wei Lin left. So Wei Lin, tell us about what you're doing now. Hi. Um, I actually work at the National Labs in Singapore right now. And I went to Brown to do geology and chemistry. I believe um, Emily was also from Brown for her grad school. Um, and then I did my master's in material science in Stanford. So I hopped around various majors. Um, and yeah, now I'm a material scientist in, in the Singapore National Labs. And I'm applying to go to grad school next year in materials for space applications. So I'm pretty excited about that because Singapore actually never had any interest in geology or space or anything. It's considered a non-field. But <laughs> in 2011, they launched our first fully home-built satellite, and that's kind of the start of our mini space program. So um, because the National Lab actually leads this effort, so I'm really hoping to jump on that bandwagon and uh, you know, contribute in my training in materials and chemistry. So yeah, crossing my fingers. Cool. All right, so we have people from all over the world. I just want to establish how many continents we have. Unfortunately, Rafael doesn't seem to be on the call, so we don't have South America. Um, <laughs> but how many people are in North America right now? OK, how many people are in Asia? Woohoo! And how many people are in Europe? OK, awesome. So at least we have three continents as <laughs> a start. Cheng Tao, by the way, uh, who is, does not have a microwave or a microwave, oh my gosh, microphone or a webcam, says he's currently in grad school, also uh, approaching his PhD. It's so how many of you are actually doing grown-up jobs right now? <laughs> That's sort of all right, cool. Um, well, one of the things that made this program so unique was the fact that it brought people together from all over the world. It was so international, and yet that's the nature of space science, is that it's a very international field. So it was natural to have people from all over the world participating. Um, I think that it's it's interesting to, to see that uh, the whole world seems to have become more international in the 10 years that, that we... Um, uh, since since the rovers landed, in the sense it's more interlinked, that there's a lot more um, communication going on uh, between different countries and different continents, um, and a lot more awareness of what's going on in, in other parts of the world. Um, I'm wondering if, if any of you, uh, if, if the international nature of the student experience helped you out in that transition, or if you can talk about um, how uh, working with people from different parts of the world may have uh, helped you or um, in what you're doing right now. Go ahead and just raise your hand or just start talking. Anybody who feels like they have something to say. You're all too polite. <laughs> Somebody needs to jump in. Abby, go ahead. Oh, oh no, <laughs> she just ejected herself from the, from the hang on, I think. Somebody else jump in. Sorry. OK, Courtney, go ahead. Uh one of the projects I work on as an astronomer is actually a multinational collaboration to try to look at planets around other stars. Um, so during those meetings, we have video calls like this with people from a bunch of different continents. Um, so the experience in talking with the student astronauts uh, who had different backgrounds and might have used different words for certain things um, really helped me out with that uh, because we learned how to communicate about science with people who weren't necessarily native English speakers. Cool. Um, and yeah, I think that uh, for me, certainly, it, I've, it, it's changed the way I communicate, the fact that I know that I'm speaking to a lot of people for whom English is not their first language. It's not a matter of intelligence, it's a matter yeah. of vocabulary. And so you have to think very carefully about how you speak and communicate to make sure that you are... Um, that you're getting across the concepts that are important to people in a way that they can, that they can understand. Um, 
another question that I'm wondering, you know, we keep on looking back these 10 years to this program and, and all of you guys were teenagers then and so, you know, you're you're much more educated now, you have a lot more life experiences behind you. I'm wondering, does did the experience of working in, in rover operations, does it really have any relevance for your current life or um, is it something that you did as a kid and it's, you know, and it sounds kind of strange to, to talk, uh, to speak and, and to rely upon the past experience of something that happened so long ago. Anybody? <laughs> Waylon? No, I guess. Oh. Waylon, oh, go, go ahead. ahead and, oh, okay. <laughs> and then I'll take, and then Abby. Yeah, um, I think it was a, a really educational experience because it was not only about learning the science but learning communication of the sciences. Um, so what I do now is actually I run um, an astronomy society in Singapore called astronomy.sg where we try and reach out to students and teach them science through astronomy. So I think the Red Rover experience really helped me with, with learning how people did that um, in an effective manner. And Abby? Yeah, I guess for me the answer is more... Um, straightforward. Oh, I've, I've actually been involved now with the Curiosity Operations, so I was out at JPL for three months kind of living the student astronaut lifestyle again um, on a different mission, so it was really nice to kind of draw from those experiences that I've had in high school and say, okay, I, I kind of understand how things are going to go. I remember there were these kinds of groups and these kinds of meetings, um, and, and that definitely helped a lot. But one thing I think in particular, the teams for Spirit and Opportunity taught me in working with those missions um, was really being able to experience how a team of people can get together and work really well together. Um, there are obviously a lot of very opinionated scientists um, that we got to, to meet during our experiences and seeing all of them being able to listen to each other and work together and come to group consensus um, was really interesting to experience as a high schooler and something that I've always kept with me is it's a, a nice example of how really good teams can work when they come together. I'll bet that um, a lot of the people on this call are curious about how Curiosity differs from Spirit and Opportunity in terms of its operations. Yeah, um, it's parts of it are very similar and parts of it are very different. Um, of course, there's now only one rover instead of two, so you have everybody on the science team on, on just one rover. It's a much, much bigger science team. I think there's something like 400 some people on the science team for Curiosity. Um, there's a lot more instruments, so there's a lot more options for kind of little tasks that we want to do for the day. So instead of concentrating on five instruments, there's now ten instruments. Um, and and the way it's structured, since it's such a, a bigger project, um, instead of having one kind of PI, Steve Squires type person, um, we have kind of, it's called the Project Science Group, which are the PIs for each instrument plus the project uh, scientist plus the deputy project scientist. They're kind of the committee that takes the role of a single PI to make decisions about the big picture of what we're doing. So it's been really interesting seeing both missions. They are very different. Um, and everyone I've talked to said there was really something very special about the way that the teams were run for Spirit and Opportunity. So I'm very glad I got to experience that kind of in the early days uh, of the mission. I'm wondering what uh, if, if some of you guys have a particular experience or story you'd like to tell about working on rover operations 10 years ago. Somebody who hasn't had their hand up before. For me, I'll re I'll go ahead and relate a little story of mine, and that was just it was it was late in the program when um, I think it was Kristen and uh, let's see Millie and Noma Timba and Chen Tao were were all there at this time, so it was close to the end of the program, and we were just um, we were in the science operations area. There was one big room in which all of the scientists tend to to gather and do their group work together, as opposed to little offices that were off to the side. And we were looking at where Opportunity had landed, and Rob Manning just happened to walk into the room. And Rob Manning is the master of entry, descent, and landing, EDL, for all uh, space missions that have ever landed on Mars. And he uh, met the, the kids, and uh, introduced, they all introduced themselves to him. And then he proceeded to give, uh, he, he told them about how the EDL had actually worked on the Mars Exploration Rover mission. And if any of you has ever seen Rob Manning speak, he is gesticulating wildly with his arms, he's talking about things coming down from space and pointing at everything, and it was just, it was a wonderful um, a moment. I, I was standing from the back, uh, 
snapping picture after picture of, of Rob gesticulating, just waving the, the spacecraft all the way down to the surface of Mars. It was, it was really awesome to have somebody like him explaining to these students what, what, how they had managed to get the spacecraft safely down to the surface of Mars. So I'm wondering if anybody else here has a story you'd like to relate. Oh, come on, guys. <laughs> Uh, Raphael and I were lucky enough to be there when Spirit landed, and I will never forget seeing how excited everyone looked uh, when the rover successfully landed. Yeah, that's definitely a very special moment when, uh, because you, you know, there's nothing that anybody in that room can do. The, the scientists in particular, they're just along for the ride. Um, the, the engineers are the ones who get the rover down to the surface. And so there's all of that tension of not being able to do anything to fix any problem. You just have to wait and hope and hope that all of the preparations you spent the last several years doing have will come will come to fruition because you'll have a, a rover safely landed on the surface. Um, the spirit was was pretty great. An opportunity uh, in my opinion was was even better. Sorry Courtney because the the first image that came back from Opportunity clearly showed rock in the wall of a crater and we knew that there was geology to be done there. It was absolutely tremendous. Yeah, Waylene and I were at the uh, Opportunity Landing, I think, uh, which was pretty awesome. Um, and I also remember uh, running into Bill Nye one of those days when he was not the CEO of the Planetary Society, so that was pretty cool. Yeah, I have photos to share uh, of that. I'll, I'll dig one up. Um, what was it like? Was it, was it what you expected to be when, uh, um, when the rover... I mean, what did you expect, and, and how was it different from your expectations? Um, I don't really remember many details, given that I was 14 back in the day, but um, we were certainly excited about the day, uh, and it did not disappoint. Uh, and it was even more exciting to actually have the first pictures come in. Uh, and like you said, I think there, was, there were also pictures of the sundial in the first batch, uh, which was cool. Um, but yeah, it definitely beat our expectations, and it was uh, fun to watch. Have, it, have any of you guys been, uh, how closely have you been following the rover missions and, and are there um, some things that you thought were particularly exciting that, uh, that happened um, on the missions since the time that you were there? <laughs> Who wants to raise, okay, go ahead, Abby. Well, yeah, I'm, it's kind of cheating for me. Um, but, yeah, I've been following Opportunity, certainly, and I'm definitely still amazed that it's still going, and especially recently Opportunity's reached the rim of this giant uh, impact crater where it kind of crossed over from the terrain and been driving on for the first eight years of the mission, and it encountered much, much older rocks that we're seeing totally new minerals in, um, and it's almost like a whole new mission starting eight years later. Uh, which has been totally cool. So the last few years it's been exploring the rim of this crater and never crater. Um, so that's been a really exciting exciting time that it's something that's totally new. Unfortunately, the instruments on the rubber aren't working as well as they were when it landed. So you have to be a little bit creative trying to piece things together with only three of the five instruments working. Um, that's been really exciting for me. For me, having the experience of, uh, of actually being inside the rover operations to, to see how it worked, um, and like Abby said, to, to see all of the, um, the teams come together in order to get, you know, they say that you get 10 scientists in a room and you'll have 11 different opinions. And so trying to, to get those people to communicate and cooperate um, was, was pretty great. You guys had an experience working inside operations where you were writing these blog entries, and um, the blog entries had to be vetted by JPL, as I recall, before before we were able to put them online. Some of you were able to to do that um, and and come up with language that the, the JPL uh, media relations didn't have any problems with, and so your uh, your uh, writing went pretty much straight onto the web. Oh, they're great! Chengtao has a camera. Woohoo! Uh, and it's awesome, actually, Chengtao, that you're coming on at this time because I remember that you of um, were uh, of most of the students who were who were on this program, for some reason, what it was that you were writing uh, tended to get redacted most often by the JPL minders. Um, and I think that that what you were most interested in seemed to be the way that the scientists were coming about their decisions, and they didn't really uh, want to. Um, 
I'm not really sure anymore what it was that that they were uh, that they didn't want to go out to the public to the public. But I think it had to do with the way that the scientists were discussing, maybe sometimes arguing, trying on different ideas, different hypotheses for how things could go forward. Um, so I, I remember that being, I think, a particular struggle for you. I'm wondering, Cheng Tao, now that you're on, if you can tell us what it is that you're doing now and how your experience in Mars Exploration Rover Mission Operations may have affected what you're doing in the present. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes, just fine. Um, uh, okay, um, I think I've uh, started working in a field that has uh, very little to do with uh, my past experience with the mission. Okay, because I'm currently working on um, automatic speech recognition, so which has t more to do with computer science and less to do with um, space exploration. But um, my past experience on working with the Mars program um, has really um, permit, um, helped me with my experience in um, communi communicating with people, uh, especially in conferences. Um, for instance, uh, I can't really remember that well, but I remember back when I was uh, at JPL, like scientists often make decisions based on um, votes and after certain discussions. And such is kind of like the nature with the most of, most of the conferences that I've attended recently. So I think that kind of relates. That's cool. I, it, you know, Courtney has a great question. I, I just asked uh, some of the, the people here to submit questions that, that we could um, ask each other. And I think uh, she suggested a really fantastic one, which is if there are any current students, high school students watching this call, what should they, if they want to have a path into a scientific or an engineering career, and we have a, a pretty wide variety of careers represented here, from planetary geologist and astronomer to material science and computer science and physics and um, it's all uh, science and engineering, and I'm uh, except. Uh, I mean, it's all science and engineering stuff, and and you've all had some some quite different paths in the last ten years. So, I'm wondering if some of you want to talk about um, uh, the paths that you took and what you found, what advice you might offer a current high school student for um, how they should go forward into a science or engineering degree. Particularly, a couple of you who haven't spoken yet, and I'm looking at you, uh, Matchik, David, and Sassini. So one of you uh, t uh, maybe talk about your path into your um, current position and what you what advice you might offer to high school students. Um, Magic, go ahead. Um, right. So after I I joined the Red Rover quite late. I was already in high school when I came to Pasadena um, to work with the Mars Mars Exploration Rover. So. Um, for me, it, it acted as a huge confidence boost, and my best advice is probably to aim as high as you dare, because um, in my case, I applied to do um, natural sciences tripos in Cambridge, and that has worked out tremendously well. Um, and also, so it was a huge, huge confidence boost for me. Um, which then meant that I could go into into my degree and feel quite confident, having come from quite a different background than most most people at the university, um, because I didn't do international baccalaureate. I went through the standard um, high school path um, through the Polish system, um, and so it's good to build up your confidence, to be aware that you can. Do things. You have to be confident enough to want to work, and then it's all it's all about the effort. Uh, it's really hard. Scientific degrees tend to be hard work, but it's work that um, I also takes a lot of work. I'm wondering if you have uh, uh, an answer to this question. Uh, yeah, my advice would be. Be enthusiastic about whatever you do, because that's what always kept me going. And one more thing is try to find the balance between what you really like and what you're really good at. For instance, I really liked physics a lot, but physics and math. And then I was really interested in planetary science after I participated in the Red Rover Girls to Mars thing. So I found somewhere where I can apply like physics knowledge and mathematical modeling in something that's related to planetary science, which is geophysics, seismology, what I'm working on right now. So I guess that's like a big point, 
know what you really like and what you're good at and be enthusiastic about it. I, I really like that, that combination of, of knowing um, both what, what you love and, and what you're good at and, and being able to find something that combines the two. Um, although there are, uh, there are places where sometimes you just got to make yourself good at something that, that you really like. <laughs> and you just have to be, you know, for, for me, I know that as a, um, as a kid, I tended to go from, from talent to talent, and I, would, I never liked to work very hard. And so I would go to things that I could do well, and I would say, oh, that thing that I can't do well, like history, I couldn't remember anything. I did terrible on tests. I was like, history is stupid because I can't do it. And so sometimes you do have to... Uh, uh, put out the effort for something that is hard, but will get you to a to the reward that you want in the end. But it's true that uh, I think it's great that a, a lot of you seem to have found what you love and are and are doing are doing some of that now. So David, please jump in. All right, I have two very disjointed stories on. <laughs> on it wouldn't be it wouldn't be you if it wasn't disjointed, David. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, it's nice to hear some nice words after so long. Uh, well, uh, after after high school, I, I jumped into my my high school astronomy club and took over and had to face kids like five years younger than me, no more, and and tell them that you know there's a point to it and 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 uh, aim high and, and study and try to be better than yourself and and, and in, interestingly it worked every once in a while because uh, for a few years like every uh, European or national competition that they ever did in astronomy our our circle won so it, it was an amazing thing and then I decided all right then I can do anything so let's pick up the, the best and most prestigious university I can find on the map and go there and change the world and that didn't work out at all. And 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 I had to go back to the drawing board and, and, and like, alright, I may not be the smartest guy in the world then, so let's let's find out what else I'm good at. And and, and that's how I, I drifted into computer science and uh, applied software engineering, which is not the most scientific, uh, although it's still engineering, but it's not the most high science of them all. And and I took it step by step and and worked myself back up. And now, ten years later, it's it's like yes, I <laughs> I, I always wanted to go for this. So find what you're good at. Hopefully, it's the same thing that you like, which for me was very fortunate. And then just be very insisting and annoying in a very nice way. That's my trick. Actually, I'm I'm really glad to hear you say uh, to talk about having trying one thing and finding it wasn't for you, and then trying something else. Because I think there are a lot of current students um, uh, in in high school, and particularly I encounter them in, in graduate school, who are fearful of trying something um, that may be a little different, or or they're they're fearful they're they're fear fearful of, of failure in, in the end because they've never really experienced it. And so they're afraid to try out a course. Um, they're afraid to try something that's that's a little, that diverges at all from the, the primrose path down to professorship at an academic institution. Um, and there are, in fact, a lot of ways to contribute to science. You don't necessarily have to become a professor at an academic institution. You can be a planner in, um, in operations. You can go more of a computer science route. You can go for a public communications route, and that's the one that I took, where I'm writing about the science rather than, than doing the research. Um, for me, it's worked out great because I'm, I'm a dilettante. I can't bear to focus on just one thing. I like to have, be able to write about a bunch of different things. And so I'm in my current position, I'm able, I'm able to write about every planet in the solar system when every spacecraft is doing to explore them. And so um, as a couple of people have said, it, it does combine some things that I'm good at and some things that I like to do, and I'm still contributing to science. It's just not in the kind of narrow way that, uh, um, that some people originally thought of. I think also that a lot of the people who applied for this program when they were kids said that they aspired to be astronauts when they grew up, which is the way that most of them um, thought about how you could be in space, literally, because you know, because kids are, are very little literal minded. And now a lot of you are still contributing to spa the space program. You're not being astronauts. You're being all of the other kinds of things that you can do, um, from physicists and geologists to computer science people and communicators to talk about about the space program. Um, 
so I uh, I have another question that I want to 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 ask about uh, to ask all of you. This program, I will tell you, it was an absolutely immense amount of work. It was it was a huge effort, and it cost a fair amount of money to run. Um, and we were very grateful to the Lego Group for for donating the money that it, that it cost to run this program. And yet there were only 16 students who participated in it. So one thing that I've always wanted to know was how uh, whether the the work that I put into this program that went through you students, did it go out to uh, more people in your communities? Did it affect more of the people back um, either in your home countries or anywhere that you went? How, how did this program influence other people beyond the 16 of you? Uh, Magic? Um, right, so Many of you probably remember that, that there was this period of time when we had this um, sort of embargo on contacting any media. Um, I think that was right up to the time when we were granted the security clearances we needed for the JPL. And so the day we were allowed to contact the media for the first time, my mom decided to phone a uh, um, university friend who is a journalist with a local newspaper. And so there was a single story run, and then the next day I spent 13 or 14 hours giving interviews to radio stations, TV stations, sort of starting 10.30 in the morning, ending pretty much when they got kicked out of our house. So it, I was amazed by the media response in Poland back 10 years ago, and there is still quite a bit of that media interest left. So even a few days ago, actually the day before Christmas Eve, on the 23rd, I was, I was giving my most recent interview because at least the local newspapers are still interested in what's happening with me, what are my plans about the fact that um, I, finished, um, I finished high school. So due to that fantastic media coverage, I think um, the Mars Rovers were very, pretty much everybody in Poland has heard about the Mars Exploration Rovers, about the Planetary Society as well. Um, and then going to high school competitions, go, when, I was, um, when I was at Cambridge, I went back to a few high school competitions and meeting at my, at my old high school, at other high schools, and everybody recognized me, everybody recognized the project I, I participated in. So yes, it was, um, when it comes to, to public outreach in, in Poland, we've done a tremendous work. Cool. I think, Vignan, you have an answer to this question, too? Sure. Um, I guess the media response back when we got selected was pretty amazing. Uh, and I think, in a, in a way, this program did reach out to, like, the one billion people in India. Um, when I did come back from... Uh, from Pasadena, I remember like just picking up the newspaper at my doorstep and seeing this news story on the front page. It was like completely unanticipated, uh, and that was awesome. Uh, and when I was in Pasadena, I gave out uh, interviews, which were streamed back to India. Um, same with Satvik. Uh, we got to meet the president of India, both of us, I think, wow. which was great. Um, he was also into space um, back then, our former president. Um, and yeah, definitely. I mean, our, our, our space exp our, our space research organization was into uh, pretty mundane stuff like communication satellites and navigation satellites and stuff. But recently, they've gone out to do more interesting things like the uh, Chandrayaan mission and recently the Mars Orbiter mission. And I think uh, people were more interested in ex and expecting this sort of stuff from the government. And this uh, competition, I remember back in the day, was sort of the first step in getting people excited about Mars, about the worlds that are out there. Um, so yeah, it's definitely had a much bigger impact than the 16 students uh, that were in the project. Cool. Waylon? Well, I am super jealous of all these celebrities here. So <laughs> <It's all> <laughs> I, I do not think people recognize me on the bus and stuff, but uh, it did go out to our three major newspapers, including the Chinese one, which I could not read. Uh, <laughs> and I remember my brother's class had to do a journal like write-up thing for his English class about this article. And I was like, whoa, your teacher knows about this. 
So there wasn't huge hype or anything in the same way that uh, Maciek and Wignan had described, but I think it did reach quite a lot of people, and especially the students, which was definitely the main target group. Cool, and how about you, Courtney? Uh, one of the other ways I think the program reached a wider audience is that when we came back to our home communities, a lot of us did outreach activities. So I spent a couple weekends going to places like the Sally Ride Festival uh, with a model of the rovers, kindly provided by LEGO and the Planetary Society, and talking to people about what the rovers had done and why it was important to learn more about our nearest neighbors in the solar system. And I think kids in particular were really excited to talk with someone who'd had a chance to be part of the mission for a very brief amount of time. And I really enjoyed that as well. Well, that makes me want to ask another question, which is why, uh, you know, if you, you do all this outreach and, and you guys clearly seem to think that, that this was a good thing, can some of you talk about why it's a good thing? Why, why is it good uh, for um, the public for us to communicate about what's going on with the rover on the, dis on the surface of another distant world? Um, uh, who wants to answer this question? Abby, go ahead. Okay, yeah, no, I think this is super important. Um, there's feedback there. Yeah, uh, I think it's super important, and I, I think I'm really glad the student astronauts were able to do what they did in communicating because, you know, things like rover missions are very complicated. There's a lot that goes on, and it's very easy for the public to not be able to follow everything that's that's been discovered and all the decisions that are being made. Um, and it's, of course, really important, I think, for the, the public all over the world to really be aware of these amazing things uh, that are happening in, in space exploration, not just from the U.S., but from all the countries um, that have been involved, you know, with the New Indian Orbiter and, and China just landing on the moon. It's, it's really fantastic and exciting, and I think having public incitement is important for these programs to be able to continue. Um, and it's important for inspiring sort of the next generation and then people like us and people younger than us to kind of stay involved and also inspiring government organizations to give the necessary funding for these missions. So I think outreach and keeping everyone informed about what's going on is critically important. Um, so I'm really glad we were able to do what we did. Vignan, go ahead. Um, and uh, apart from the scientific value and communicating the discoveries of these missions, I think space science has this unique potential of sort of firing up the imagination of people, of students particularly, and stimulating creativity. Um, so when they learn about these projects, this sort of fires up the people and gets students more interested in science in general. And I think space science also has that value. India is particularly interesting right now, of course, because you are, uh, congratulations, you are now uh, newly a member of the Interplanetary Spacefarers Club. Um, your, uh, India recently launched the uh, Mars Orbiter mission, which is now on its way to Mars, should be getting there at the end of, of next year. Um, how, how have things changed uh, in India in the last 10 years in terms of the public perception of the value of space exploration? A few years ago, I mean, I remember reading a newspaper article from uh, the director of ISRO, which is our NASA equivalent, and he said, we, we're unlike NASA and we try to keep our space programs limited to those that have a tangible uh, value, like communication satellites and navigation satellites and whatnot. So it's a big departure from that position of ISRO a while ago. Uh, and I think having a few Indian American astronauts like Sunita Williams uh, Kalpana Chawla definitely helped, uh, and it's it's also seen as a prestige issue. Having you know being in the elite club of countries that have uh, launched uh, interplanetary missions, um, but yeah, definitely like I said, it, it it's helped the youth and the students of the country um, get fired up about science in general. And um, in contrast, um, I, you know, Wayland's talked about this a little bit, but Sassini, you know, Sri Lanka is not a country that currently has a space program. Um, so I'm wondering if you could talk about what uh, the public perception of space exploration is in your country and whether you think that's changing. I think the public perception has changed a lot during like the last 10 years, let's say. And there was like a huge awareness about Mars after I came to this program. I was surprised that like I was just a kid, but there's this huge interest that was caused in the country because of me. But even after that, somehow people were people are interested. But I think the government needs to pay more attention to 
science and technology in general instead of, I mean, not just a space program. Uh, yeah, but there's a long way. Do you think do you think uh, that a, that space exploration? You know, uh, some of the people um, here have spoken about how um, space exploration can be inspiring on its own to more to to interest in science and technology more generally. Do you think that that can operate in Sri Lanka, or do you think that your country is needs to focus on um, uh, say the kinds of things that Vignan talked about about the kind uh, kinds of science and technology that are more tangible benefit to your country? Yeah, I think right now they have to pay attention to some sort of science and technology that would give some tangible benefits to the country at the moment. But eventually it'll be important to pay some attention to space exploration as well. But that will be a long way to go, I guess. But it's important to keep the interest and enthusiasm up in people. Now, Courtney and Abby, you were dealing with a very different media environment here in the U.S. where um, we tended to find here that you, you probably got interviewed a couple times and then probably people kind of forgot about it. Can you, um, can you talk about the, the, maybe some of the, the challenges of trying to get uh, awareness for this, uh, this kind of program in the U.S. And, and what you think works here or what, do, what kinds of benefits uh, need to be focused on in order to get the word out about science and technology? Um, or if you can also think and talk about what you've seen as any changes that have happened in the last 10 years in the U.S. perception of science and technology. I don't know which one of you wants to take that first. Courtney? I guess I'll start. Um, so one of the interesting things about the U.S. is that because we have had such a large history in space exploration, I think people found it a little bit less exciting that someone was participating in a mission. Um, and there's actually a good side to that. It means that we've gotten used to the idea that we can explore other planets. Um, but if you're trying to raise awareness, it can make things a little bit difficult. Um, so what I thought worked well for me in the program was that if I tried to focus really small, and instead of trying to do something on a national scale, to go to a nearby elementary school or middle school. And in some ways, I think that can have a bigger impact down the road because even though you talk to a smaller number of people, you can make a stronger connection with them. And then they can possibly maintain touch with you over the years. And you can actually mentor them through as they go through their careers and they make decisions about what classes to take in high school and what summer activities to do. Um, and hopefully help them to consider a career in science technology rather than just showing them a brief clip on the news one evening that they probably will forget about in another five years. Um, but ideally, you'd have a mix of both. Um, also, Abby, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I would I'd agree with Courtney in the sense that it's almost a little bit harder in the U.S. because we've had so many successful missions from this country that it's, oh, they have another rover on Mars. How many are there now? Um, but I'll also say I was really surprised and pleasantly so about all of the buzz that happened when Curiosity landed. And there was a ton going on. They broadcast the landing in Times Square. So it, it's very good to see that even though this is something that the U.S. has been able to do uh, over the last few decades, um, there's still a great public interest in space exploration. I'm wondering, um, it, uh, and I'll throw this question out to all of you, so feel free to, to raise your hand. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if you had, um, if you want to look ahead to the, to the next 10 years or so, um, are, there, are there things that you're particularly looking forward to in space exploration or in science and technology more generally, um, developments that you'd like to see um, and are there particular problems that current students um, are, are going to be, that either you guys are looking forward to solve or that um, you want to, you want h current high school students to think about places that we really need people to uh, work on and study in order to, to solve problems um, that we're facing right now? Um, <laughs> and David, I don't know if that's a joke. I kind of like your answer. Go ahead and give it. And then anybody else who wants to raise your hand, uh, let me know in the chat and I'll order the, the answers. That's, that's not fair. I haven't thought of a serious answer. I just said flying cars, obviously. <laughs> but we only got two years left for that. Uh, well, it, it's a flip answer, but but I think that, um, y you know, when you, there, there's always some seriousness to a joke, right? I mean, we were promised flying cars. Why don't I have my flying car yet? So, so what do we, what, how would you answer that question, David? I don't know. Uh, if, if, if I had to think back, because I've been following some space science in the last years, the, the most uh, thing that made my eyes sparkle, saying, yes, this is what I want to see in my lifetime, was, was probably, I don't know, asteroid mining or, or something that feels like 
the, the next step for humanity, and it's and it's still exciting to to know that we're living in in that age when might happen then we might make the step up and, and go out there and yeah who who doesn't want to retire on Mars come on <laughs> I personally don't think retiring on Mars would be very comfortable but it would be quite an <laughs> quite an adventure um, I'm I've actually uh, I might want to ask how many have any of you applied for Mars one I'm curious <laughs> I'm kind of glad to see that none of you is crazy enough to apply for Mars one um, <laughs> So, Waylon, I'm wondering if you have an answer because you know you you're not you're not in space science. You're in material science, and and I personally, I reading um, Science Magazine and and American Science and other magazines about the developments that are happening in, in material science. Just fascinating the kinds of things that we can see happening in the next ten years. You know, what's what do you look forward to? So this is going to be Silicon Valley talking, but it's uh, mostly <laughs> alternative energy. So you know, electric cars. Um, sustainable buildings, the kind that that energy in ener and energy out is exactly the same. There are these Japanese teams that are actually looking at building entire floating cities on the sea that can move wherever they want to, um, and they're entirely self-sufficient. So they grow their own food there, and they uh, everything's recycled basically. So a lot of this is enabled by materials, I think, at the at the very smallest structures, the nanostructures, and yeah, I don't know. I guess I I am looking forward to us not killing the Earth. It it is <laughs> the the situation does I'll look that. stark, and I don't know if you guys have seen this this uh, college humor video where they were saying that you should name hurricanes after climate change deniers. Did anyone see that? <laughs> yeah, but. It, it, it is a, a problem that I think not everyone has decided they want to face, and I, I really hope that we solve it really soon. Yeah, does, does anybody else want to um, answer this question about what's... Uh, uh, I think, Courtney, you wanted to talk about, about what we had to look forward to. Sure. Um, I study planets around other stars, and one of the things I'm really excited about in the coming 10 years is that we have a bunch of new missions coming, that will look at the whole sky, looking at the nearest, brightest stars. And we're going to find planets around those stars that are very close to us. And then we're going to have large telescopes on the ground that will allow us to learn more about those planets and figure out if any of them have signs of life. Um, and I think it's likely that within 10 years, we're going to be able to identify a handful of planets that are very close to us that might be able to support life. Um, we're not going to be able to detect life in 10 years because that's very complicated, but we're going to be able to know where we should be looking, uh, which is pretty exciting. Um, you know, uh, Waylon brought up um, climate change, which is kind of a downer, but it is something that I think is is really important um, for us to be, be facing over the next 10 years. I'm wondering um, if, if anybody else wants to talk about um, about you know your generation's perception of that particular problem and what um, what we need to what we need to do in in order to uh, solve it. Wayland says Singapore's going to sink. <laughs> That's not even funny. Um, anybody else want to want to answer this? Um, I think we started talking about uh, international collaboration in space science, and I think that very much applies to climate change as well. Um, we need these countries to come together uh, on a non-technological basis, I mean, in a different perspective, to just come together, form consensus, and take care of it on a global scale rather than, you know, do country-specific things. At least in India, we see um, uh, news about how our environment ministry resisted pressure from the developed countries and, you know, uh, was able to successfully stall negotiations or something like that, and we're cheering for that. Uh, I don't know how that's going to work out in the long term, given that we all share the same planet. You know. Maybe this is my idealism speaking, but I'm, I'm wondering if, if the, you know, an international space program is sort of a way to help um, foster that, that the kinds of co cooperation and collaboration we've been talking about today are, um, are a way to, uh, you know, help move forward on some of these much more challenging problems that the, that the world is facing. Um, 
so I think that, that that actually that note may be a great one to, to end on. We're, we're right on the, the hour here. I'm wondering if anybody has any final words or anything you'd like to say to current students or um, any wish you'd like to send uh, to Opportunities Science Team still working on Mars, still on a whole new mission on the end of Endeavor Crater. Um, go ahead and raise your hand. Anybody want to say anything? Abby. Sorry, my feeding there. Um, I, I just want to say that this was really fun getting to talk to everyone, and it was really interesting hearing perspectives from everyone, uh, given the fact that we're all in different countries and all in different fields. Um, so thanks for organizing this, Emily, and, and thanks, everyone, for sharing your opinions. This has been really neat. You're welcome, Abby. It's, it's absolutely my pleasure. Does anybody else want to add anything? Uh, go ahead, Courtney. Oh, I also wanted to thank you for organizing the Hangout uh, and to everybody for coming in at various hours of the day. And also thank you to the Mars Exploration Rover teams for inviting us to share the experience with you. And to the Planetary Society. <laughs> <laughs> and Lego. Don't forget Lego, too. And Lego. <laughs> So yeah, this I mean this really was a tremendous program. It was a lot of work. It's it's always a pleasure for me to hear um, how uh, it's influenced both you individually, but I I'm uh, was particularly happy to hear how how its influence reached more broadly um, out into other countries, maybe less so in the U.S. and more so in Poland and and Hungary and India and Singapore and Sri Lanka. That's just tremendous to hear. Um, I'm just so I feel very proud of all of you guys. You've um, you're you've all gone um, into um, you're working on really interesting problems, whether it's in space science or not. Um, you're working on in interesting fields. You're all uh, you're all um, just awesome people, and it was my pleasure to work with you. And and I hope that uh, we'll get together again. Maybe we'll have to have a. Hopefully, let, let's not let it be ten years this time. Let's uh let's to get together again for another anniversary sometime before too long. So. Um, thanks, everyone, for participating. I am Emily Lakdawalla, the science, uh, the senior editor for the Planetary Society. Um, and uh, thank you all so much for participating in this program and for bringing your perspectives. And uh, go out and save the world. Let's, uh, let's, uh, let's change the world. Let's make everything better. And uh, I'll see you guys um, soon, hopefully. Bye, all. Thanks for watching.